Jack them up, boys. <clears throat> I'm going to talk just a little bit before Elliot comes up. I want you to see, if you don't know who Zion's Watchman is, that's what uh, John Somerville and I are doing, and that's what uh, the ministry is called. <clears throat> and there's a reason that it's called Zion's Watchman. I just realized that on this screen, it's hard to see the, the verse, so I'll read it to you. It, Isaiah 21, 8, this is in the Amplified. It says, And the watchman cried like a lion, O Lord, I stand continually on the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my station every night. And what is that for? That's to watch over Israel, to be, to be about Israel, to be behind Israel, to take care of uh, what God's told each one of us to do. And we don't just do this when our friends from Israel are here. We do this all the time. It is our job to watch over and to pray for. The Bible says to pray for the, the peace of Jerusalem. And even though we think there's peace in Jerusalem, and, and we know that different things have been going on from time to time. People asked me, and, and Elliot did, and I did a little, the reason we kind of made a photo finish here, we were in my office doing a, a little uh, video about the safety of Israel. And something that came to my mind that we didn't talk about on that is they've been fighting over there for 2,000 years. Actually, they've been fighting over there for 4,000 years. And there, there's no reason that we would think that that would change now. And the only difference is, is for the first time, we have the media that covers it on an hourly basis. And that's the only reason we, we think that there's other stuff going on in that place. So what I know is when Isaiah said that we're to watch over Israel, uh, in Genesis it says, I'll, I'll, pro, I'll prosper those who bless you, or I'll bless those who bless you. And I'll curse those who curse you. So we know that as a, as a nation, it's imperative that we watch over Israel and pray for Israel and we bless Israel. Uh, I recently told uh, Elliot, I, I actually called him from the airport in uh, Tel Aviv when we were on the way home in November. And uh, at that time, uh, Hegel had just resigned. And... Uh, I told him that I wasn't settled with who the people were that they had to replace them because it had shown, you know, and at that time they named a couple of names that uh, they were going to have uh, replace him, and they hadn't been behind Israel before. One of them had created a mess in the Middle East before. And so um, I, I, I told Elliot one thing, and I'm sure he remembers this. I told him, I said, in 2016, we're going to change the regime. I said, in 2016, we're going to change the regime. I ought to hear an amen from end to end in this church. Because here's the other thing. I t he says, I'm going to hold you to it. And he says, but what happens if it, if it doesn't change? I said, what, you're going to have to tell me what's for sale in Galilee next to you because I'm moving. Because I intend to live in a place that will bless Israel. <clears throat> and I intend to live here because we're going to bless Israel. I want to look at a couple of things this morning. Every state has the right of self-defense and to secure borders to protect itself from hostile invasions and terror. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size, some of which are large bases of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. After the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 stated, that Israel was entitled to new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley, Israel's eastern frontier, forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq and Iran. 
The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200 foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world, aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet. It dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Missiles launched from the Judean hills pose an immediate threat to Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. More advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and a demilitarized Palestinian state. Israel's narrow borders means a combat aircraft can cross the entire country in under four minutes. In less than two minutes, an enemy plane could penetrate the country's airspace via the Jordan Valley and reach Jerusalem. In order to thwart an aerial attack on Jerusalem, a hostile plane must be shot down at least 10 miles east of the capital to prevent it from crashing into major population centers. Therefore, Israel must be able to identify hostile planes before they cross the Jordan River line and intercept them shortly after. To defend itself, Israel must control the airspace over the West Bank. Israel's transportation arteries, and in particular, the Trans-Israel Highway, enable travel and connection between Israel's regions. They also assure the mobility of the Israel Defense Forces in case of attack. Protection of these vital arteries is essential in order to ensure that, one, civilians aren't victims of terrorist gunfire. Two, regions of the country cannot easily be cut off. Three, the mobility of Israel's defense forces is not hindered in the case of invasion. To defend itself, Israel must control its main arteries of transportation. There is enormous uncertainty about future trends in the Middle East. Iran is determined to become the supreme power as the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. No one can guarantee the future of many of the current regimes in the region. Today more than ever, it is crucial to ensure defensible borders for Israel. So uh, <clears throat> when we uh, look at this, and, and some of you have seen this before, and uh, we have not heard lately as much about going back to the pre-67 borders. It is not an option. Uh, it is not an option in my mind because of what the word says. They occupy the only ground that is God-given, not, not something that was conquered. God gave Israel uh, their land. And actually, and I, I put this picture up there just to give you an idea of uh, the size of Israel. It's approximately the size of New Jersey. Uh, or it goes into Texas 37 times. So that gives you an idea at the size uh, of Israel. This is a, a mandate. It was called the Bellflower Declaration. It was written to give Israel their own land in uh, 1917 by England. 
in uh, this was the land that the Bellflower Declaration gave Israel, which is actually the, the same borders that God gave to Israel. Uh, and, and we can see by looking at it right now that it's different today than it was. I don't believe they should give up land. I believe that they're going to acquire all the land that God gave them in the very beginning before the end of time. And uh, what happened when, in, with the Bellflower Declaration is at that time, I was a little afraid that wouldn't show up, so I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> Joel and it says in the, in the first part, it says, what, by what standards are nations judged? I don't want to be judged by what Joel says in, in our land. And it's important that we continue to stand behind Israel and, in, and, and make our delegates stand behind Israel. Because Joel 3, 1 and 2 says, In those days and at that time... When I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter my judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and they divided up my land. And I don't want to be counted in that number. Uh, what, what happened with the uh, Bellflower Declaration in 1921, only four years later, uh, England took away 77% of what they had given them, which we now, at, the, at that time, they called it Transjordan. We know now that it's called uh, Jordan, and, uh, and, and that land has been divided up even with Iraq at this time. So what happened with England is this is in, in 1917, this is, all, everything that's in red was English uh, pr property or English colonies. And I was walking around actually in uh, Nigeria one time and I was trying to figure out what happened. What, why did England pull out? Well, the truth was is England didn't pull out. They lost it because they divided up the land. And at that time, it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. But now today, the British Empire takes up just the little island of England. And that's it. The British Empire doesn't exist. Kathleen and I, when we were in uh, uh, San Juan uh, back in December, uh, I, I looked at what had happened. That was one of, part of the British Empire at that time. And they built great fortresses. It didn't help them. That now belongs to the United States. Guess what? I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose any ground that we have because we're going to continue to stand behind Israel. We're going to continue to be a biblically correct in what we do. It even says in the New Testament in Romans, Paul said that God didn't replace Israel, but he grafted us in. Galatians 3.29 says that if you belong, if you're in Christ, then you're heirs according to the promise of Abraham. Didn't replace the promise of Abraham, but instead we became grafted into the promise of Abraham. I told uh, Elliot earlier this week um, where I got to meet Elliot the first time he got on a bus when I was on a a pastor familiarization tour and, and spoke real quickly because his daughter was going to take him to the airport so he could fly to the United States to speak. And uh, I told him that day I gained a friend. And I, I not only call Elliot a friend, but I pray for his family. And, and I know that God's plan is to bless that land because it, that is God-given land. Elliot? you. This on? Ah, yes. Yep. And we're going to leave this Thank map you. up here for him. It's great to be back here. Shalom. Shalom from the Holy Land to the Promised Land, Texas. Yeah. It's always good to be back. Uh, actually, let me start with a really important lesson. Make sure somebody braces the ladder. You'll notice I'm limping a little bit. Uh, really important. 
I'd like to start with um, a bit of commentary on the biblical, if I may, and I'm going to end with a little commentary on the practical, and in the middle talk about what's been going on, who's out there, who we're facing, uh, and a bit of what's going on today. But I, I want to pick up on, on something that Pastor David said uh, in general about the idea of the land of Israel and what it means, and something from a Jewish perspective. There's a great medieval commentary named Rashi, uh, who wrote an extensive commentary on, uh, on the Bible, on the Talmud. And the first commentary that he wrote is on the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, in the beginning. And he raises an interesting question. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the brief, sort of the synopsis of it. He says that if the Torah, the five books of Moses, are a book of laws, why doesn't it begin with the first law commanded to the children of Israel? Which is, I won't test you, the beginning of chapter 12 of Exodus, this shall be the first, the first of your months. This month shall be the first of your months. Now, you know, there are 50 chapters in Genesis, and this is the 12th chapter of Exodus. And in other words, there are 61 chapters before the first commandment, the first law given to the children of Israel. That's a pretty long introduction. And so he asked, why? Why doesn't it just start there? And here's a man who lived about a thousand years ago in Europe at a time where he had no real inkling that he would ever see the land of Israel, and he didn't, I mean, except in the hope that Messiah would come, and he hadn't. So he writes something that's very interesting for his time and place that relates to where we are today. He writes the following, he says, in the future, when the people of the world shall say to the Jewish people, you have stolen the land. Sound, sound familiar? The answer will be, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God divided up the world among the nations and gave that little piece of land to the Jewish people. And that's why you have to go through this whole story of creation and God's will and that sort of thing. So let's start with that, just sort of sitting in the back of our heads. And let's talk a bit about who's out there. Um, I've been here more than a few times, and I'm not going to go into in detail some of the stuff that I've talked about before. But I think it's important for us to understand and, and to remember that almost all of the chaos that goes on around us, and you can look at this map, and kind of with the exception of that little red dot in the middle, You've got a sea of turbulence, violence, and chaos going on out there. Okay, an occasional, occasional cool spot along the way. But basically, this is an, an enormous storm. And I don't know if you saw the news this morning, ISIS beheaded uh, a Japanese hostage, which gives you an idea, I mean, almost graphically of the extent of that evil. Because if, you know, if radical Islam is killing Japanese in Syria, it kind of gives you an idea that there's not a lot left out there that's not caught up at Boko Haram in, in Africa, and we're really talking about the entire world. Almost all of that turbulence, violence, and chaos draws its roots from a single organization, a single movement called the Muslim Brotherhood. And again, the Muslim Brotherhood is a story in and of itself, and I'm not going to go into it in detail. I just simply want to state out loud for all of us, those who know, worth repeating, for those who don't, worth learning, the motto of the Brotherhood, which is that Allah is our objective, the Quran is our constitution, the Prophet, meaning Muhammad, is our leader, Jihad, meaning holy war, not some internal struggle to improve myself and make myself a better person. Holy war is our way, and perhaps the most important and the most difficult for us to understand and comprehend. Death, for the sake of Allah, is our highest aspiration. Okay, now, I say this most difficult for us to understand and comprehend. It's important for us to know it, hard for us to get our heads around it. We come from a system that says, choose life. All right? I mean, it's commanded, choose life. And death is our highest aspiration. They say, we love death more than you love life. Now, I say give them what they want. 
be friendly, cooperative, right? Okay. Uh, but that's who we're talking about. And that might help explain some of the inexplicable that we see around us. Some of this death is not only what they're inflicting on others, but what they choose to inflict upon themselves. And we look at it and say, no, it can't be. Well, we think it can't be because we're coming from where we're coming from that. People don't, don't behave that way. But of course they do. And we have to listen to them. We have to pay attention to them. By the way, they're being very... Uh, very cooperative. They tell us outright what they believe and what they think. Sometimes we don't believe it. That's our mistake. When people say things, we should believe them, at least up front, especially when they're talking about their own principles and, the, and, their, and their own behavior. So that's the background. All of these people, all of these organizations draw their ideology from the Brotherhood. Now, they're in some conflict amongst themselves, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but when we talk about Hamas and Fatah, by the way, the, the so-called secular moderate organization. Iran and its proxy Hezbollah. Al-Qaeda and its spin-offs, Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS, ISIL, Islamic State. Okay, those guys are so nuts that Al-Qaeda says they're crazy. How's that for a recommendation? Okay, we're normal, we're just Al-Qaeda. All right. They all draw their ideology from the Brotherhood and from the Brotherhood's ideology. Now, they're in a bit of conflict over tactics. They're a bit in a conflict over their own power between themselves. In other words, who's going to be in control? But not, they're not in conflict over what they want the ultimate goal to be. Some of it, is, again, is over who's going to implement, who's, who's going to reap the benefits of the ultimate goal. But the ultimate goal is the establishment of the universal khalifat, in other words, the universal Islamic control of the world. And they're very, very, very upfront about it. We ignore them at our peril. Now, with that in mind, over the summer, um, this past summer, we had a round of fighting with Hamas, Hamas, who calls themselves the Muslim Brotherhood branch in the Palestinians. Uh, they tell us also very clearly and outright what they have in mind. Now, a lot of people don't like Hamas or these guys, these, these other types. I like them. I like honest murderers. It makes my job as an analyst really easy. Here, here, let me give you an idea of what I mean. When you do strategic analysis, usually it all boils down to two categories. One is called capabilities, and the other is called intentions. By the way, a lot, in, a, in a lot of analysis, it breaks down to that. Normally, typically, it's easier to gauge and calculate capabilities. Intentions are a little murky, right? In other words, if I'm doing a military strategic analysis, Capabilities, how many tanks do they have? How many planes do they have? How much artillery do they have? How well trained are they? How well organized are they? How good is the, are their logistics? I know what their capabilities are. I know what, what, what they're capable of doing. Their intentions could be a bit murky. After all, have they acquired all of this force to attack me, to attack somebody else? Maybe because they're afraid of attack by me or by somebody else? What are they gonna do with it all? Very, very difficult and, and the root or the, the consequence of that uncertainty leads to surprise. Pearl Harbor, for example. Yeah. Knew what they had, where are they going with it? Hamas and its clones and brothers and cousins make my job much easier. I know what their intentions are. The opening line of the Hamas Charter, which they call the Charter of Allah, the Charter of God to them, starts with the words, Israel will exist until Islam obliterates it. Any questions? Figure out what they have in mind? Okay. When the Iranians say, we want to wipe Israel off the map, and by the way, when they say death to America, and they celebrate death to America day every November, Right, you celebrate Thanksgiving, they celebrate Death to America Day. What do you think they mean? Right? It's, right, it's really not that complicated. So now when I gauge their, their capabilities, I can actually track, are they really building in order to do what they say they want to do? And the answer is yes. So this past summer we had a bit of a conflict, violent conflict, conflict with Hamas. They fired a bunch of rockets into Israel. Uh, we responded as minimally as we possibly could, and here I have to tell you, with all of the noise and, 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 and the tragedies involved, 
the war with Hamas is something of a sideshow. They're not the real deep threat to Israel. They're a security threat. They can kill people. I don't want to belittle them. But in terms of the grand scheme of things, they're something of a sideshow. Somebody asked me earlier uh, last week, is Israel worried about ISIS? I said, ISIS has to take a number. Okay, I mean, talk about what we're really worried about. So Hamas also, I mean, it's out there, it's a concern, we have to take them seriously, but there's something of a sideshow. Uh, that war really erupted, not so much because of the rockets. We dealt with the rockets, we have the Iron Dome system that we talked about, we've got a good civil defense system that was able to protect a good part of the population. There were tragedies, and I don't want to make it sound you know, offhanded, it was a war, but given that nearly 4,000 rockets fell on Israel, fired out of Gaza, the number of casualties was kept to a bare minimum. And again, in part because of interception, in part because of good civil defense, in part because Israel, Israelis followed very clear instructions they were given. What changed the game in Gaza, and indicative of what we're looking toward into the future, was their use of tunnels. They had dug tunnels under the border from Gaza into Israel. By the way, uh, don't believe everything you read or hear in the media, by the way, don't read, don't believe anything. You, <laughs> I always say, in a newspaper, the only things you can believe are the date and the price, and the price is negotiable. Okay? Uh, all the rest is you know, a little sketchy. The Israeli military was not surprised by the tunnels. We knew about the tunnels. We've been dealing with tunnels now for over a decade. We were not surprised by the attacks from the tunnels. We were not anticipating, but not surprised by the fact that they were going to use the tunnels on the scale that they did. And when they did use the tunnels on the scale that they did, we had to respond accordingly. What do I mean by that? You may have seen the, the clip of the terrorists coming out of the ground. Uh, right, there was the, the camera, the, the border camera that was on them, suddenly they come pop, popping out of the ground um, and then running back in, sort of like whack-a-mole, whack you know? <laughs> um, here you need to know a little bit about a, a bit of background. For those who didn't see it, uh, we have border cameras all along the border. This one was on this spot. Suddenly one terrorist comes out, another terrorist comes out, another one. About 15 of them came out. The soldier, the female soldier who was on that screen, and by the way, for those who don't know, the eyes and ears of Israel are female. Okay. Uh, the, and, I, and, and here I have to say girls, because they're 18 and 19 years old. Okay, uh, they're the ones who are on the screens, whether they're the radar screens or the cameras uh, or whatever, on the listening devices. And they're extremely capable, extremely responsible. And here I have to tell you also creates something of, of an amusing, given the circumstances seriously, but amusing kind of a, of a situation. Anybody who's been in the military can appreciate this, where you have some 18 or 19 year old PFC or corporal getting on the radio and telling some lieutenant colonel battalion commander, right? I've got an alert at this spot, you better get over there right now and deal with it. And he says, yes ma'am, I'm on my way right now. <laughs> Going. Uh, and occasionally after it's been a very long night, after a very long week, where he's fatigued out there and it's three or four in the morning and he's had enough already, and he responds the way anybody would with that much fatigue and over that, oh, leave me alone. And she gets on and reads him the riot act over an open radio net. And then he says, oh, yes, ma'am, that's right. It was a mistake. I'm on my way. Uh, so very Israeli kind of experience. She did an amazing job. She did exactly what she was supposed to do. She saw them coming up. She sent, sent out the alarm. The ground forces started to move in. That's, how they, that's when they started to run back to the hole. And the Air Force showed up as well and fired a missile in and killed a bunch of them. And then we investigated. And really, here's, here's the point. We found that there were somewhere between 35 and 40 terrorists. Most of them had scooted back to Gaza through their rat hole. But, and here's the but, the plan was to put 40 terrorists into a small village called Kibbutz Sufa. This was not going to be a terrorist attack. It was going to be a massacre. Okay, what happened in Paris was a terrorist attack. 40 terrorists in a small village means killing every last man, woman, and child in that village. We're talking about an entirely different scale of operations. 
Now, I'll tell you one other thing about what happened that night. And it's important in understanding our response. With all due respect to that female soldier, and she really did her job correctly, one thing she didn't have to do is guess where that camera was supposed to be. Because she was told the evening before by military intelligence, move the camera to this spot and leave it there and keep watching. Okay? Now, our intelligence is very good. And I say that not as an intelligence officer, because I'm not. I'm a consumer of intelligence, not a producer. Uh, I have subordinates who claim that I'm not even an intelligent officer, but I'm certainly not an intelligence officer. Uh, well, subordinates, you know, that's why they're subordinate to me, right? Uh, but you can't rely on it 100%. Intelligence doesn't always work. In other words, when it works well, it works maybe three quarters of the time. And, you, and there is no iron dome to protect against the tunnels. In other words, if they manage to launch successfully, they win. And they, by they win, I mean they kill a whole bunch of people. And it was on that basis that the decision was made to go into Gaza, not to invade Gaza. We went in across the border to find the entrances to the tunnels. And here another point. Uh, that's kind of important. You can't find the tunnels from the exit points. Okay? Anybody ever seen the movie The Great Escape? You may remember they tunnel down, they tunnel out, but when do they punch through to the surface? Only when they're ready to go. Okay, so the tunnel is 99% done, but the surface of the exit area is not touched yet. That only gets opened up when they're ready to come out. So you can patrol the area where the exits are and never see them because there's nothing to see. You have to find them on the entrance side. So we went in, we went into two towns in a neighborhood, Bet Hanun, Bet Lahia, and Saidjia. Had some nasty fighting there because they didn't want to give up their tunnels so readily. And we found them. Uh, the numbers aren't important. 35, 40, 45 tunnels. Uh, the real number is probably a bit higher. And we blew up all the tunnels that we found. I have not yet met somebody in the business who believes that we found all the tunnels, but we, we certainly broke up their system. They're, as we sit here and speak, they are digging new ones. They use children, by the way. Those children die in droves in the course of the digging. Nobody says a word about it. Nobody says a word. Digging tunnels is dangerous business, especially when you're doing it with hand shovels. So that's something that we're facing down there. Once we had destroyed all the tunnels, and by the way, all the buildings in that area and most of the buildings in Gaza were booby-trapped, which made the business an extremely dangerous business, we finished up and we pulled out. That was not sufficient to get them to stop shooting. We escalated because eventually, as the Godfather said, nobody can reason with these people. We have to move it up a bit. We started taking out their leaders, and then they got the message. And here I think is an important point for us to understand because, you know, Hamas is a suicide organization. You might think that there's no way to threaten a suicide organization. After all, what are you going to threaten them with? But I think it's, we should consider the fact that you don't rise up through the ranks to leadership in a suicide organization. Right? You don't start at the bottom, commit suicide a few times, and then get promoted. Right? It's not like the army that I serve in where the only legitimate order you can give on the battlefield is follow me, right? For them, it's, no, no, follow you, right? There's, there's a very clear line, the heroes who go to Allah and the heroes who send them to Allah. Please note Osama bin Laden was not flying an airplane on 9-11, right? He was busy somewhere else. And then when they went after him, the American forces went after him in Tora Bora. There was no bin Laden's last stand. He had to be tracked down with his wives and his pornography in Pakistan. Leading from the front, not exactly. So when they started threatening the leadership and killing the leadership, they said, okay, we get it, we quit. And we've had quiet there since then. Uh, the ceasefire is held because they got the message. That's not the end of the story. It means that we've gotten it into sort of this part of the wave It'll come up again sometime in the future. Fortunately, now the Egyptians are working with us. President Assisi of Egypt has become a very good friend of Israel, not because he's joined a Zionist organization, but because he realizes which side his bread is buttered on. Okay. 
listen, let's face it. They tried to kill him. We helped. Suddenly we became friendly. Makes sense. So that's the situation down there in Gaza, and I mention it for a couple of reasons. One is because it gives a kind of a microcosm recent example of what's likely to be and what's going to be different, and there, I'll talk about what's going to be different. But it also gives us something of an image of the nature of the fighting. And here, again, especially because Israel is facing all sorts of investigations by the UN and the International Court and all of those guys, uh, we need to understand a bit about the, na that, the nature of that kind of fighting. During this war, as in every war, within the reasonable expectations of the battlefield, Israel has done everything it possibly could to protect civilians on both sides. Hamas did everything it possibly could to endanger civilians on both sides. Okay, and for this, you don't just need to take my word for, the, for it, although it's true. Uh, you can look up a fellow by the name of Richard Kemp, a British, retired British Army colonel, commanded British forces in Afghanistan, who gained notoriety in 2006 by saying, I'm sorry, 2008 and nine by saying that no army has protected enemy civilians in history like the Israeli army. Okay. So this is you know, not, not somebody from us from the inside, somebody from the, from the outside looking in. The Israeli military is the only military in the world that has a unit of soldiers who are fluent speakers of the enemy's language, whose sole mission is to call enemy civilians on their cell phones and tell them in their own language, we're going to be attacking your area tomorrow at let's say 10 o'clock, better you shouldn't be home. And then follow it up with an SMS just to make sure they get the message. Now think about what that means in terms of dedication of assets. Take a bunch of very clever young men and women Train them, unless they're already speakers, in Arabic. Not use them to listen to enemy broadcast and to analyze enemy information, but simply to speak to enemy civilians and tell them, you need to move out of this area before it gets hit. Think of how much intelligence work goes into identifying enemy civilians, getting their cell phone numbers, knowing where they live, and putting together the appropriate lists to know who to call under what circumstances. It's a huge, huge dedication of assets. Nobody else does that. We've created a device called the Roof Knocker. The enemy uses human shields. They also use human sacrifices. In a moment, I'll tell you what the difference is. But when they use human shields, they take a target that they know we're going to hit, and, and how do they know we're going to hit it? Because we call up in advance and tell them. Get the civilians out. They move civilians in. Typically up on the roof so we can see them. They'll pack a roof with civilians. What do you do now? You've got a bunch of rockets packed into a building. You need to destroy them. Or a bunch of rocket launchers. You need to destroy them. And there are a bunch of civilians on the rooftop. Moral dilemma. It really is. You don't want to kill civilians. And we don't. Incidentally, here let me just add as a digression. Some people say, why don't we do to them what they would do to us? And my answer is because we're not them. If we become like them, what are we fighting for? What's the point? Let's just join them and be done with it. Mm -mm. We have to fight on our terms with our values, doing it the right way as we know to do it. So we created something called the Roof Knocker, a missile with no warhead, it doesn't explode. You fire it at the roof. Hello, we're coming. Everybody scatters, and then you can blow up the target. The UN calls that a war crime. Yes, you're firing a weapon at unarmed civilians. OK, cutting off heads of Japanese hostages, that's not a war crime. Right? That's why we call the UN useless nudniks. Okay, But think of how much energy, thought, resource goes into doing that. I mentioned before buildings in Gaza were booby-trapped in huge numbers. Any other, any other army in the world, and I know this for a fact, and military people among us can dispute this if you like, and you'll be wrong. Any other army in the world coming into an area that is booby-trapped enemy buildings would simply blow them up. 
detonate the explosives and kiss it all goodbye. We sent in bomb disposal experts to dismantle those booby traps so those buildings would not be destroyed. So people could move back into them after we pulled out. There was a great deal of destruction in Gaza caused by secondary explosions. For those who aren't familiar with the technical aspects of that, high explosives, when something detonates near them, blow up. And we would go after targets filled with explosives. And you can see it, by the way, you can see it in the, in the, photo, the aerial photographs. The weapon that we fire hits, it explodes, and a fraction of a second later, you see a second explosion, that's the secondary. Except that a lot of these buildings were connected with tunnels, and the tunnels were filled with explosives. And we would see the hit, the secondary in that building, a secondary in the tunnel, and a secondary in another building two blocks away, and then another one in the tunnel, and another one three blocks away from that. Okay? And of course, it was Israel's responsibility for all of it, because after all, we should know these things. So this is part of the world that we're dealing with and part of what we're facing based on our most recent experience. But as I said, that's a sideshow. I serve in Northern Command. We're responsible for the Lebanese and Syrian borders, and that's the direction that we're looking today. With Iran sort of looming around in the background, I want to say a few words about those areas. First, Iran. Uh, as I said earlier, Iran, death to Israel, death to America, that's a sort of daily refrain. Um, they pray five times a day. They say death to America, death to Israel 100 times a day. And they mean it. They've killed Americans in large numbers right up until recent days. Uh, it was known in Iraq and Afghanistan the deadliest IEDs came from Iran. And we can go back to the early 1980s. Hezbollah, which is an Iranian agent, blowing up the American embassy in Beirut, blowing up the American Marine barracks, killing 241 American Marines. Uh, this is not news, and it didn't go away. Those are the people we're dealing with. Iran is trying to get nuclear weapons. We know it, they know it, everybody knows it. There are all sorts of different ways of trying to stop them. I won't get into American politics too much, but the executive branch thinks you stop them by letting them do it. And at the moment, Congress is kind of hamstrung between members of the president's party who don't want to cross him and members of the Republican Party who are squabbling over the wording of the resolutions which is kind of like fighting for position of the deck chairs of the Titanic. Okay? And that concerns me a great deal. Not only as an Israeli. Because not only are they trying to get nuclear weapons and not acquire them, but acquire the technology to build them. Which means they're not talking about one or two, they're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, because otherwise you don't invest so much in that much technology of production. They are also building ballistic missiles. The world woke up to this a few weeks ago. I've been talking about this for years and I didn't make it up. We've known about this for many, many years. Ballistic missiles that can already reach Central Europe. They have ballistic missiles that are on the verge of being able to reach Western Europe. And one step beyond that, not that far down the road, ballistic missiles that can reach the East Coast of the United States. What do you think they mean? Let me help you out. Death to America, nuclear weapons, and ballistic missiles that can reach the United States of America. Okay? This, tw this question will be on the exam. Okay? And if you're sitting here thinking they would not be crazy enough to fire a nuclear weapon at the United States, I will refer, to, refer you to a huge literature of the late 1930s, 1940, 1941, in which people, very intelligent people said, the Japanese would never dare attack the United States of America. In 1940, 1941, they would never dare attack Pearl Harbor. Oops. Now it cost them a lot, but how much did it cost America? So keep that in mind. That's where they're going, and they make no secret about it. Closer into us, we have utter chaos in Syria, as you know. Hezbollah, Iran, the, the Syrian government, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, ISIS, the Kurds, the Russians, with America, Europe, 
Qatar, everybody sort of joining in on the, in the party in one way or another. Utter chaos that has already reached our border. Hezbollah now operating not only out of Lebanon, but on the Syrian side as well. It's one of the things that we tried to set back a few weeks ago by striking a bunch of Hezbollah leaders and Iranian commanders. We killed a, an Iranian brigadier general on our border. By the way, if you're looking for work, Iran has an opening. Uh, we also killed a few very important Hezbollah leaders, not the least of which Jihad Murnia, the son of Imad Murnia, who we killed about seven years ago. Uh, Jihad Murnia, would you name your son Holy War? Okay. His father was the guy responsible for the American embassy and the Marine barracks bombings, and a whole bunch of other things. We took them out, apparently, I, the reports just came out this week, were made public, uh, with the help of the CIA. CIA is trying to claim credit now seven years later, but um, hey, listen, they haven't had some good years, so. Uh, so the sun didn't fall far from, you know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, uh, so we sent him to meet his father a few weeks ago. Uh, hope they're having fun. But in any event, part of why they were along our, our border with Syria is to build up another front against Israel. I want to sort of conclude the analysis, the idea of who we're dealing just with, in just with Hezbollah, and why I said before that Hamas was a sideshow. Hamas started this most recent war in the summer with some 20,000 rockets. And in the course of the war, they fired just under 4,000 into Israel. Hezbollah has over 200,000 rockets. Longer range, larger payload, more accurate, and with a launch capability that far, far exceeds that of Hamas. I don't want to go into, into simple numbers. I can't go into, into details, but I can say this. A normal Hamas launch was eight rockets, which is why the Iron Dome was able to be so effective. Hezbollah has the capability of launching dozens upon dozens upon dozens simultaneously at a single target. Iron Dome won't be able to cope with it. Simply too many in sports is called flooding the zone. Okay, the interceptors just won't be able to launch fast enough, and we're talking about rockets with a flight time of 30, 40, 50 seconds. So most of them will get through simply because the system won't be able to stop them. We're talking about not seeing 4,000 over a five, six week period, but 4,000 over a two day period. And do the arithmetic, at 2,000 a day, 200,000 rockets gives them quite a bit of breathing space, even if we take a bunch of them out along the way by, with the Air Force. They are gearing up for a multi-month war with the ability to fire between one and 2,000 a day into Israel. What that means from our perspective, well, I'm sorry, before I, even, before I go into our perspective, they've also been fighting heavily in the war in Syria. Now, the good news is a bunch of them have gotten killed. The bad news is that the organization is gaining a lot of combat experience. In other words, the Hezbollah that we're going to face on the ground is far more competent than the Hamas that we faced over the summer, or even the Hezbollah that we faced in 2006. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to win. We're a lot better than they are but it means that the fighting is going to be at a different level. It means we're going to, going to have to use that much more combat effort to achieve the objective. And because of the nature of the firing at our population centers, and incidentally, those rockets can reach virtually all of Israel. They can reach into the northern Negev, which means Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa, the major cities, and all of the minor cities around and between them are in range of Hezbollah rockets today. What that means is that Israel is going to have to move very, very fast because the only, only way to stop those rockets will be to conquer the areas that they're being fired from in Lebanon. And everything that I said earlier about doing everything we could to protect civilians will apply, but only in the context of having to move very, very quickly against a tough enemy. In other words, it's going to look much, much worse than it has in the past because it's going to be much, much worse than it was in the past. We won't be able to operate in the leisurely fashion, and it was leisurely fashion, that we did, let's say, this past summer. We're gonna go in today, we're not gonna go in today, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, it's okay. Another couple of hundred rockets doesn't make that much of a difference. When 2,000 are falling every day, that question is not gonna be on the table. 
I mention that to you because you're going to be the people who are going to be seeing it on the news. The commentary here, I can already tell you in advance, is not going to be nice. Uh, one, of, one of the interesting classical headlines of this past summer when something like this and re recurred a number of times, there, there were a number of ceasefires in the course of the summer, and the headlines read something like this. Ceasefire breaks down as Israeli airstrikes pummel Gaza. And then in the small print, following 12 hours of Palestinian rocket fire. Okay, so let me break this down for you. The Palestinians fire rockets for 12 hours. That's not a violation of the ceasefire. When Israel responds, that's the end of the ceasefire. Okay, so if that's the kind of reporting, then I think you can understand what it's going to look like when we really are going in hard and heavy. And that's the picture. Um, I wish I could give you really good news on this, other than the fact that we're going to win. Um, but I do want to conclude, I told you I was going to start with something sort of specifically biblical and end with something a little more practical. Uh, but practical still in, in religious terms. I mentioned Rashi, the great commentary when I commentator when I began. Here I want to mention another um, great Jewish writer, philosopher named Maimonides. Also lived about a thousand years ago. Uh, he was a philosopher, he was a physician, and he was a great scholar of Jewish law. And he wrote quite a number of works, but the one that I want to refer to was called Mishnah Torah. It was a 14-volume set of a treatise on Jewish law. Real easy reading, okay? 14 volumes on Jewish law. And in the introduction, he asks the following question. Again, remember, Maimonides is a physician, he's a philosopher, he's also a legal scholar, and he asks the following question. He says, is keeping God's commandments healthy? Fair question, right? It's a fair question. And his answer is the answer of a philosopher, physician, Jewish legal scholar. And he says the following. We have to follow God's word because it's God's word. But it's inconceivable that God would tell us to do something that wasn't good for us. So when we talk about supporting Israel and standing with Israel, it's one thing, and certainly I don't dispute it, the few quotes of the many that were brought here earlier today, and there are many in, in the scripture, about the land and about supporting the land and being with the Jewish people in the land. And it's God's word. But I will further say that it's important because it's good for you, not just good for Israel. And I think Pastor David pointed out some of that earlier today. So thanks again for having me. It's great to be back in Texas. And thanks for being here and God bless you. Amen. So God's word says, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. I don't think we need to read any farther than that to know that what Elliot was talking about, what was going to happen to, not that there wasn't going to be a war, but who's going to win. Because if God curses those that curse Israel, what's the outcome? Oh, well, they're cursed. That means they can't win. So, if you're watching by internet or you're, you're here uh, for the first time when Elliot's been here, you find out that when we talk about standing behind Israel, uh, it's not talk. It's something that, that we at this church believe is imperative because God's Word says it. And it's not okay to sit down and take it easy and wait until the news says that there's a, a big uproar. <clears throat> I'm, I, I believe that the ideology of those that surround Israel that don't believe that they should exist uh, is going to continue until the end days. And until that time, it's imperative that you and I Pray for Israel. Stand behind Israel and take our vote for Israel. Uh, because uh, 
our executive branch, as it was so eloquently put a few minutes ago, um, is subject to change. And it's only you and I that, that have the opportunity to do that. And when we do that, we realize that it's not about the vote saying, well, I don't like that guy and I don't like this guy. Know where they stand about Israel. Because that has everything to do with how, what the outcome of our life is going to be and how we're going to proceed in that. Because you and I can stand with Israel, but if our nation doesn't continue to stand with Israel, I don't want to look like the British Empire. I want to look like a country that stands for God and what God says, because it's not about Israel, but it's about what God's Word says about Israel that makes us stand for them. So I want to uh, invite you at this time. We're going to stand and, and pray together as we're dismissed. Just in case uh, you came today and thought, well, you know, I thought I was going to hear preaching. You heard the Word. And you heard what's going on. You, you know why it's important for Elliot to come when he's here? Um, we, uh, he has an open invitation here. Uh, when he's in the country. And of course he came for uh, what he considers uh, one of the holy days. He always comes and watches a Super Bowl with, uh, with David. Uh, they've been doing that for, I think you told me, 30 years. Um, so uh, he came to, to do that. And we, got to, we got to have him come here because the Super Bowl is later this afternoon. Um, but the reason that Elliot has an open invitation, we need to know what, what direction we're praying. It is biblical to pray for Israel, to stand with Israel. And if we don't know what direction to pray, you know, I can tell you what I see, but I don't see the same things he does. <clears throat> and if you have him for a friend on Facebook, I did tell him that he's the only guy that I know that takes a picture of his feet. Um, <laughs> that was after the ladder fell. Uh, and the reason I knew it was there was because Kathleen says, did you see Elliot's post today? Um, you, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to pray for this family and for, for who they are and, and what they do. And, and, and knowing that God's wisdom is going to lead him into the place that he should as an officer in, in the place that he serves. And knowing how to stand in that place. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you give us to watch over and be Zion's watchman. Father, that we pray for Israel, we stand with Israel. And Father, thank you for the knowledge that you've given us this morning at the direction that we should pray. Father, I pray today for uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the, and the th decisions that he makes as the leader of that country, that they'll be god led decisions and father they'll be before time and not after time father that you'll uh, guide not only Elliot but every one of the officers that, that make decisions that are whether they, they're consultants or they're in intelligence father that they'll make God led decisions in every place that they do I pray for the peace of Jerusalem I pray for the protection of Israel and father I thank you that you watch over them and guide them father watch over us and guide us Cause us to, to know your will in all things, not just over Israel, but in all things. Father, that as, as we understand your will and your guidance and what your word says, that we'll be quick to follow. Father, and I thank you that you are the leader in our lives. And Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor and power in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Remember, Jesus loves you and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the Word preached. And as you apply that Word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making Him your Savior and then making Him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. 
That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior, and He is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria, and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo, and uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.